so how many of us reside in the Northeast U.S.? 55 million of us in the Northeast U.S., right? So it's a major economic region of the, of the world, about 20% of the GDP of the U.S. alone. And so I'm a climate scientist, and I study uh, climate change, climate dynamics, climate variability. We obviously understand that mitigation is really important. We've got to reduce our use of fossil fuels, get a rapid ad adapt adaptation of um, renewable energy sources, but climate change is happening and so we must adapt. So I'd like to step you through some of these climate changes. Uh, as I said, I'm a physical climatologist and a geographer, so I like to make maps and look at maps. And like Molly said a while ago, maps are really important. So let's take a look at some of these climate changes and some of the adaptation strategies that we're employing um, to handle some of these changes. So in the Northeast US, we're seeing approximately a 70% increase in the heaviest precipitation events. So think, for example, the number of days each year where we see one inch of precipitation and, or greater. Typically, in the past, we would see something like maybe 10 of those events each year. Well, now in the Northeast US, we're seeing approximately maybe 17 of those, right? A 70% increase in those events. The greatest increase of any region of the US. We're wet here, and the climate's warming. A warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. So we're seeing a big increase in extreme precipitation events. And one of the things we can do to adapt to this is the use of cisterns, OK? Cisterns capture runoff from impervious surfaces and direct it to a storage. So in the example here, we see a roof that's approximately 900, let's say 1,000 square feet can capture around 7,000 gallons of rain each year. And that's for an example where we see 12 inches of rain each year. In the Northeast US, we see about four times that amount. So a typical roof that's about 900 or 1,000 square feet can capture upwards of about 30,000 gallons a year. Now that's not all the domestic use of most households, but it's a large fraction of that. So these cisterns can direct some of this runoff from roofs and impervious surfaces and direct it to a storage instead of it going into runoff in streams and then end up in a, let's say, or sewers and end up in a treatment facility where it has to be, we have costs, we have energy uses to process all that water. So it's really important to store some of that water. And another example of adaptation in the Northeast US is the use of culverts. Okay, culverts are where roads and rivers intersect. And in the Northeast US, well, in New Hampshire alone, there are approximately 20,000 stream crossings. And with an increase in precipitation and increased flooding, we need to expand these culverts. I was part of a project supported by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation a few years ago where we looked at what we can expect in the future for extreme precipitation events in the Northeast US how big these flows are, and then what sizes do we need for these culverts? How big do they need to be to account for this flow? Because it's really important these culverts have to be sized correctly because if they're too small, that increases the flow, the velocity in the culverts, and that leads to erosion and sediment transport, and that's really problematic for aquatic animals. So a culvert needs to be as wide as the riverbed. Ideally, it's arch-shaped, and also, ideally, it has a natural bottom to allow for movement of aquatic organisms. So it's really important to think about culverts and expanding those as the climate warms and we get increased hydrological flows, extreme precipitation events. We're also seeing extreme heat events in the Northeast US and other parts of the world, obviously. So the association between extreme heat events and emergency room visits is notable, is significant. So once we get up near about 90 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, we see about a doubling of the risk of emergency room visits. And in the future, this was an example from a study for the state of Rhode Island. And in this example, under the highest emission scenario in the future, we might see a number of increased visits in emergency rooms uh, under the highest emission scenario by the end of the century. Anywhere from about 6,000 visits a year to upwards of 7,500. Cooling centers are a really, really important 
important part of adapting to climate change. Cooling centers, we need to obviously uh, understand where our vulnerable populations are, take a look at where the resources should be deployed. Are these cooling centers located in the right areas? Do they have enough resources? Um, is there enough public information about where they're located, when they're open? Can we use things like malls and schools, air-conditioned areas, to protect our most vulnerable populations? Really important. Some of these extreme heat events in the Northeast U.S. are driven by not only warming being forced by increasing greenhouse gas concentrations right directly on land, but also the warming in the Western Atlantic we're seeing. So this was an anomaly from a couple of years ago that showed extreme warming in the Western Atlantic, an anomaly, so a departure from an average condition here and a departure from the 1985 to 2012 average, showing the warming in the Western Atlantic. And interestingly, a study that was published in Nature just a few years ago showed that the warming in the Northeast U.S. is highest, closest to the coast. And the author of this study, a colleague of mine at UMass Amherst, determined that some of this warming along the coastal regions is due to um, atmosphere, changes in the atmosphere, but also due to this warming in the Western Atlantic. So the Western Atlantic is getting warmer and Warm ocean water holds a lot of moisture, holds a lot of water and heat, and doesn't dissipate it as easily as the land does. So building materials are really, really important to understand, okay, can we limit the extreme heat stresses we're seeing in our populations um, by using wood instead of brick and concrete? As you know, making of concrete is the, one of the major contributors of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we go to using things like wood, Wood can actually sequester carbon. It's inert, and it's as long as we sustainably grow our forests. So important use of building materials. We don't want to use brick anymore because brick holds the heat in. There were approximately 20 or 30,000 deaths in Western uh, Europe a few years back, about a decade ago, in an extreme heat event. Brick apartments are really, really problematic. Declining snow cover. Uh, is another issue in the Northeast U.S. So it's getting warmer, winters are getting warmer, we're seeing declining snow cover, and particularly in the Northeast U.S., probably a larger decline than any other, other part of the U.S. Upwards of 60, 80, almost a 100% decline in the ski season. So do we need to repurpose and think about some of these ski resorts and maybe using them for, or hoping that they get converted to warm weather recreation? And the housing that's there, the lodging, the, you know, the apartments, the condominiums, maybe they should be repurposed and used for housing of workers. And then how about small uh, houses, tiny houses, using them for workers in that area? Um, ski resorts in the Northeast U.S., in the southern parts of the Northeast, probably are going to have a big problem sustaining themselves as snow cover declines. We can still make snow, but it's hard to make snow when the temperatures are above freezing. Invasive species are proliferating across the Northeast U.S., more so than perhaps any other part of the U.S. Approximately a 100% increase is likely toward the end of the century in the case of the highest emission scenario. So what can we do as far as invasive species? We've got to think about strategic planning, preventative maintenance, management. When these invasive species show up, we need to have treatment and control. Education and outreach is really, really important. And then policies that consider climate change impacts on these invasive species need to be taken into account. How about warming of river waters and their impacts on fish? So brook trout in particular in the Northeast U.S., are seeing a lot of increased stress due to the warming rivers in the Northeast. Here's an example from a study published recently that shows by the end of the century, under the higher emission scenario, perhaps a one degree Celsius increase in river water temperature. Well, there's not a whole, whole lot we can do about the river warming besides mitigating our use of fossil fuels, but we can think about dam removal. So removing dams, Restoring natural flows in the rivers, uh, there were approximately a little over 50 dam removals in the U.S. last year, and uh, it's likely in the next few years we'll see that increasing. There was approximately, with those dam removals, a restoration of uh, around 2,000 miles of rivers to their natural flows. 
The Investment Infrastructure Act that was passed uh, allocates around $2.4 billion for the removal, retrofit, and rehabilitation of dams. So let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you.